Are you ready to take your real estate investing business to the next level? Well, you're in the right place. This is the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. With your mentors, Wayne and Gabby. Good morning and welcome to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Today is Monday, October 2nd, 2023. The weather today will be a high of 15 degrees in Edmonton, 14 degrees in Calgary, 12 degrees in Vancouver, 11 degrees in Saskatoon, and 23 degrees in Toronto. Thanks, Evie. It's finally fall everywhere except Toronto. <laughs> What's the weather in Toronto? 23. Oh, good for them. Yeah. Wait, hang on, Strong. Um, I actually, I saw some stats uh, that Toronto's, our Toronto listenership jumped up like crazy over the last 60 days. Interesting. Was that like, was that because I talked about them? Hello, Toronto. Maybe. I don't know. When did you talk about them? I think I, I think I talked about. I don't know. I, I feel like I feel like in the last two or three months we talked about Toronto. Then probably not. We said something, and um, <laughs> anyways, I just thought I was quite surprised, like the the huge jump that we had for Toronto listeners, um, huge jump for Ad- uh, Calgary listeners as well, and Vancouver. Um, as of just the last, I think three to six months, um, Edmonton has dropped off. Actually, we have less listeners. Wow. Uh, we lost listeners. Wow. Thanks, guys. Um, Thanks for your local support. Yeah, we are no longer the hometown <laughs> team. We're the hometown heroes. Um, uh, and Montreal is still sitting there in fifth. Um, but nice. yeah, the, the top listeners is Calgary. And uh, Toronto is there in second. Cool. Good for you guys. And don't we haven't forgot you too, Vancouver. <laughs> Vancouver Thanks as well. for listening. Yeah, some big jumps. Uh, you know what I think it is? Is that I think that uh, I here's here's what I here's what I think. I believe that uh, I believe that there's lots of talk about Edmonton right now mm-hmm. and the opportunities there. It's it's one of the last affordable big cities um, that kind of makes sense, and it only makes sense that other big cities are looking in that direction. Yeah. Um, and Calgary, you know, well, Calgary is just only three hours south. So, it's, you know, the, the information is very relevant. But also Calgary is getting a little hard to find cash flow. Oh, Calgary is uh, getting crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like even uh, Calvin Realty started, I saw they're doing some advertising about the price differences between the same same types of houses. Like yeah. I think the last one I saw was, um, you know, like a standard bungalow in Calgary being like, you know, nice and renovated and stuff, but being yeah. 700,000 and you can get the same house in Edmonton for under 500,000. Yeah. 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 I I love seeing that though. I love that because um, historically, historically Edmonton has always, uh, sorry, Calgary has always been first and Edmonton always been second. And um, it's not a guarantee, but what you can expect is you can expect whatever is happening in Calgary will very likely um, similar, yeah. Follow suit in Edmonton, just uh, slightly down the road. Um, so that's that's exciting for us. Um, I don't know if Edmonton will ever finally, you know, jump up in prices again. Uh, it happened. It happened in the early two thousands. So I mean, it could happen again. But um, yeah, that that would be a great that would be a great great thing to happen. I, I'd love to see our portfolio jump up. <laughs> as much as we've seen Calgary jump up, that would be super cool. I'd be, I'd be very happy about that. Um, hey, in case I didn't mention this, uh, we're broadcasting live as we do every morning, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. Mountain Time on the Podbean app. If you'd like to be a part of the live show and uh, be a part of the discussion, all you need to do is just download that app, search up the Real Estate Investing Morning Show, and uh, you'll get notified at 6 a.m. Mountain Time or whatever time uh, it is for you that we are live. You come on in and uh, there's a there's a chat here. Um, any questions you have about real estate investing, put in the chat and we will answer for you. Free coaching every morning. Heck yeah. Right. Uh, who do we have joining us today? 
Um, I think I think uh, everybody's having a hard time waking up this fine Monday morning. Uh, I had a little trouble. So did I. <laughs> well, you and I decided to watch a movie late last night, which was stupid. Stupid, but it was also it was nice. <laughs> we don't really have time to watch movies anymore. That's true. Well, and not true. You make time, Wayne. We, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, but uh, I don't know. Just after the kid goes to bed, it's like. Enough time for a two-hour movie. Yeah. Which I think that movie was like two and a half hours. Yeah. It was a long movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we have we have Adam here with us and Josh. Good morning to Paul and Don. We have Sean, Chris, good morning, Denise, Stephen, Chaston, Sheila, Colton, Tyler, Colin. Mm. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Garrett. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, let us know if you guys have got any questions that you would like answered. Um I've gotten a few recently, but I feel like so some some have come through, but they've all been like recent things that we covered on the podcast. Mm-hmm. And so in most cases, um, whether they be DMs or whether they be emails to info at reimorningshow.com, I've just been sending them being like, Oh yeah, we just covered this like last week. Here you go. And I've been sending them recent uh email up uh, uh podcast episodes. <laughs> podcast episodes yeah where we've covered it so nothing really kind of new to cover um except for you know a couple questions um it looks like colin's got a question here yeah that we can definitely get into um a market research question what's the minimum number of sold comps 60 to 90 days that will interest you in investing in the market neighborhood i'm trying to identify where the demand is for some flips and burrs Ooh. damn i feel like it's a really good question for uh, calvin yeah realty definitely um, it's a realtor question, but you know, I'll, I'll take a look at that on our break. And, um, again, and just got to put some thought into it. Um, I wonder when Calvin's supposed to be back on the show. It's gotta be soon. Feels like it's been a while. Yeah. Probably about two weeks from now, I'd say if not this week, then maybe next week. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely, I'll take a look at that again. Just, and, um, when I'm not talking on the break <laughs> and just kind of process that a brief one. moment to think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How was your weekend? Fan-fucking-tastic, Wayne. Yeah. Fan-fucking-tastic. I had the best weekend ever, and I am I am feeling pretty drained. I don't know if it's just because woke up late, or uh, sorry, stayed up late last night, um, but I'm, I'm feeling very tired, so we'll see how I get through the day. But um, very cup-filling, purpose-driven weekend. Damn. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, I got to hold my very first uh, women's full moon circle. It was absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to just, if I could just uh, quickly tell a little story, because mm-hmm. um, that night after the women's circle, uh, one of my really good friends, uh, Jamie, who I haven't seen in over a year and a half, um, she came out to the women's circle, which was incredible. And then her and I stayed in a little yurt on the property, which was like really freaking cool thank god there was like there wasn't heaters so thank god there was heated blankets because it was a chilly night (laughs) um so we were all snuggled in and in the middle of the night i was woken up and as you guys know uh, at least here in edmonton the the clouds cleared um for the evening which was incredible because the full moon was absolutely brilliant it was so bright and so big and uh so i woke up in the middle of the night to wolves howling I thought like I thought that just because I'm not used to hearing wolves, I just automatically thought it was coyotes. But when I sent the recording to my mom, she's like, I'm pretty sure that's wolves. And um, so half the tent, half the yurt was lit up by the full moon. Like it was like half the tent was bright because that's the side that the moon was on. And these wolves were just going crazy. There was like packs of them in all different locations. And so like one one pack would be like howling and then they'd stop and the next pack in the distance would be howling and they'd stop. And then like one on the other side would be howling. It was like crazy. It was such a cool experience after such an incredible evening. That's awesome. Yeah. So it was like, it was kind of like the, the, the cherry on top, yeah. you know, yeah. like just to like finish off the evening. Uh, Garrett's in the comments here. He says, Jackie had a lot of fun. She's happy to found some hippies. <laughs> um, yeah. I heard lots as well from people that were there, uh, women that were there and they all spoke extremely highly of it. And you, 
I'm really happy to hear that because as, as the like facilitator, you know, you're like in, in the zone, like doing the, making sure your agendas go into plan and all that kind of stuff. So you don't quite get the same experience as somebody attending. So I'm, I've been really happy to hear all the feedback. It's been That's really, awesome. yeah, it's been really fulfilling. Yeah. And then, um, on, uh, sun, on yesterday, yeah. I got to run our REI master's, uh, mentorship, uh, workshop which was awesome. I got to talk about all the female and masculine energies, feminine and masculine energies, uh, determining your values and, uh, and vision boarding. So those are all the things that really got me to the point where I am today. So it was like one of those full circle moments of like being able to share the tools that um, really inspired growth within myself, which yeah. was just so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really terrific uh, workshop on, I guess, just taking all the things that Gabby just mentioned and just kind of into consideration and, and helping you create a little more balance, um, in your life as a real estate investor mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, just as a person, um, the journey and life of a real estate investor can be a little hard and, to put it lightly, <laughs> um, just truly really understanding why things are the way that they are, why you are the way that you are, can really help you put measures and routines in place to make sure that you're staying balanced and not just always staying in the, well, I mean, like, I don't want to give away the whole workshop, but just, you know, really balancing that masculine and feminine energy, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's, it's, it's you did such an amazing job explaining it that like I feel like I'm gonna butcher it. But for those of you guys that were there, um, you guys know what I'm talking about. It was just um, there was a whole lot of there was a whole lot of aha moments. There was a whole lot of minds blown. We saw skull fractures all over the webcams, um, <laughs> and as well there was a whole lot of um, hands raising the roof. Uh, it was it was. Um, it was really eye opening. At the same time, it was also a lot, a lot of fun. Do you want to know what one of my favorite things about yesterday was? What that workshop was? Um, seeing seeing you go like, oh, holy shit! Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't realize this about myself. That was so cool for me to be able to, yeah. Because like you know, my assumption was always just that like, ah, oh, Wayne's not into any of this. He doesn't care. I never talked about it with you really. True. So yeah, to have that um, to see your your mind be blown too was pretty cool for me. <laughs> Absolutely. It was a lot of fun. Sean's in the comments here. He says it was very good. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah. So that was, it was quite the weekend mm -hmm. that you had there. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, also hung out yesterday afternoon. Yes. Yeah. We went and had a little celebratory afternoon after a successful weekend. It was fun. Um, we, yeah, we went out for lunch and then we went and did a, What's it called? The scavenger hunt? Yeah. Like City of Edmonton scavenger hunt. Um, so yeah, it was like we went downtown and had all these things to find and pictures to take. And then we discovered that they had a whole bunch of games set up in um, Churchill Square. Yeah. So you and Everly were playing chess and it was basketball and yeah, mm -hmm. it was a great afternoon. It was. Yeah. Um, what'd you guys get up to? We're talking about our whole weekend. What's it's let, if you guys are on the live show, let us know what you got are up to. Mm -hmm. Um, what you got, you know, what you did this weekend. I know that a whole bunch of people here went to the uh, Calvin Realty Invest Tour, including yep. yourself. Yeah, how was that? It was uh, pretty freaking awesome. Um, they always put on good events. Mm -hmm. Um, really great team, great energy. I was gonna say high energy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I caught the tail end of it. I caught the this. We had some stuff going on on Saturday. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I went there for the, for the last stop on the tour and also, uh, um, for the after party, I was a guest speaker on the panel and, uh, it was a lot of fun. Got to meet, to meet some new people. Um, it was a lot of talking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it was great. There's a, there's a lot of people I haven't seen in quite some time. So catching up, um, saw some people that we haven't seen in a long time and, uh, met some new faces. So. Uh, networking events are, are fantastic. If you're if you're a new real estate investor or even, a, you know, you've been around for a while, going to networking events is a great way to connect with others and, and to, to surround yourself with like minded individuals. So mm -hmm. it's it's really nice to, um, you know, to get out and, and to connect with some people that are that are like minded, you know, what yeah. I mean? yeah. um, that are that are on the same kind of path and wavelength and 
And um, also, you know, I had a good conversation with a really new investor who was literally like, this is the first thing they came out to do. And um, just, you know, watching their eyes just widen when they start seeing all the possibilities of what's possible with real estate investing mm -hmm. and seeing people, you know, that are slightly, maybe only six months, 12 months ahead of them and, and the amount of growth that they've had. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty cool. So yeah, I had a good conversation um, with that person as well. And, and yeah, really cool event. Really awesome. great. Good. Um, Garrett in the comments here said it first entire weekend off since May. Shit. Signed our new tenant to our newest rental, worked on the tree fort with our daughter, watched our son puke from the flu and cleaned out all the storage sheds and garage. Wow. So pretty uh sounds like a um eventful weekend eventful weekend yeah <laughs> thank you <laughs> very much very much okay well let's take a quick little break here and then we'll hop into uh, colin's question and uh i had another question as well from the email um we can cover that as well if you got some time sounds good be right back are you just starting to build your real estate portfolio at kirkwood and brennan we are real estate investors and mortgage brokers who understand real estate investing not only do we help you get a mortgage, but we help you build a better real estate portfolio. Check us out at kbmortgages.ca or call 778-847-0552. Take the time now so you have more time later. Hi folks, Barry McGuire here. I'm inviting you to join our free Facebook group, Barry McGuire's Creative Real Estate Education. We go live every Monday discussing all sorts of creative real estate strategies. You know, nothing can match the power of learning from Canada's top creative real estate experts. We provide you with the education and tools you need to close your first damn deal. It's the most important one. Join our free group, Barry McGuire's Creative Real Estate Education, and we'll see you Monday. Need cash for next flip or burr project? I have funded Wayne and many of his mentees over the years and have excess capital ready. I'm not a broker or a middleman. A flipper myself, I know you have to move quick. I hate points and extra fees, so I don't charge them. Interest only. Plus, add on funds as the project progresses. I do only first mortgages for Alberta investors. Tim Blake, 780-897-8847. Tim at conquestdevelopments.com. And we are back. And hey, I'm, I'm curious, guys. How many of you guys have actually reached out to some of our sponsors on the show? Mm, good question. Um, I know that Tim's gotten lots of calls. Has he? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Tim's got lots of calls about um, um, uh, the private funding uh, for deals. Um, Barry McGuire, for those of you guys that don't know who Barry McGuire is, um, he's the the OG guru of a creative real estate. Um, Barry and Donna taught us everything that we know, and we, yeah. we always – any opportunity we get to say that is to, is to, to give credit uh, where it's due. Yeah. All of their home study kits, their courses, their workshops, um, were everything. We took that, we applied it to our business, and we are where we are today because of them. Yeah. That's a, it's a big reason why all of their home study kits are part of our, our REI program. Master's yeah. Mentorship Program. Yeah. When you join the mentorship program, you get all of their home study kits for free. Um, but, you know, if you guys are thinking about doing – agreements for sale, rent to own, uh, wholesaling, fix and flips, options. What's the one I forgot? Joint ventures. Joint ventures. Uh, definitely. You know, they, they they are the only courses that I endorse. Yeah. And there are lots of courses out there. Some of them are good. Um, none of them are great. Yeah, uh, Bear is the only person you should be learning creative real estate from. I, I, I'm i just going to say that and I'm going to have no regrets about saying that. 100%. You shouldn't be learning from anybody else. Yeah, and I, I think one of the biggest one of the biggest reasons is because of their win-win mentality. Yeah, we've seen uh, some other courses and what they teach and it's, it's I promise you, it's not win-win, it's not proper. Just don't do it. And, and Keaton, I mean... He, Brilliant guy. I mean... I've heard many people call him the 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 like the the mortgage broker for investors in Canada, mm -hmm. and also Calvin Realty. Calvin Realty. Uh, if you guys are you know planning on buying or selling your investment properties in uh, the Edmonton area, definitely give Calvin Realty a call. Um, that's the ones that put on the invest invest tour this past weekend that I was just talking about. Um, I'm going to read actually one of uh, Calvin Realty's. 
uh, reviews on Google. So you guys can see what their clients are saying about them and not just us. It was great working with Calvin Realty. Ryland Strauss did an excellent job leading us in the right direction with the real estate questions we had. He was very patient and gave us confidence in working with Calvin Realty in the future. Awesome. Short and sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I saw um, Ryland. I had a quick chat with him mm -hmm. over the weekend. Yeah. Really nice guy. Awesome. Was their whole team there? You betcha. Yeah. Uh, and they were rowdy. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. They they're they're a lot of fun. There's a lot of energy with yeah. them. It's 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 a it's a really fun group. Um, and I, I was as I was leaving, I'm like Calvin, you guys were uh, getting a little getting a little loud, and he goes, "We like that fun." <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just a really really they're just fun. Yeah. They're really fun. Okay. Um, I mentioned the REM Masters Mentorship Program very briefly there, and how uh, when you join, you get all of Barry McGuire's home study kits. Um, if I recall what you get when you join for free. Uh, so you don't join for free. Like you get <laughs> for free when you join. <laughs> um, well, you, you, you pay for it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, is you get uh, their joint ventures home study kit, rent to own, agreements for sale, wholesaling, and their booster pack, which includes options, wholesaling, and fix and flips. So you get all of those home study kits. Um, when we were building REI Masters, uh, the mentorship program, we just like we didn't see any point in trying to reinvent the wheel when it was a perfectly good wheel. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with it. And we knew that they had the best creative real estate education out there. So, um, you know, we worked it out with them that they, you know, uh, that we could include that into the mentorship program. And, and they support us and we support them yeah. 100%. So yeah. it's great having their blessing and having their support. Mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for what they did for us. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're so incredibly happy to see all of our mentees in our program, you know, continue to continue that philosophy of win, win, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and using these strategies that they, in this education that they, that they get to, you know, build something for themselves. So it's really, it's really, really, truly amazing. Yeah. Um, if you guys are interested in joining the REI Masters Mentorship Program, just go to www.reimasters.ca. All righty. Okay. So. Uh, Question from Colin? Yes. Okay. How about it? How about it? How about that? Colin says, I got a market research question. What's the minimum number of sold comps, 60 to 90 days? that will interest you in investing in the market slash neighborhood. Mm. I'm trying to identify where the demand is for fix and flip spurs, et cetera. That's a terrific question. Um, I'll start off by saying that uh, market slash neighborhood, I mean, when it comes to fix and flips and also burrs, I believe that market is irrelevant. You really have to dive super deep into it and go neighborhood specific because uh, a certain city, you know, some people might say that a certain city is really good for flips, but uh, the neighborhood is the most important because as he's referring to the, the sold comparables is what determines what the value is based on, you know, appraisals. So um, definitely I would say cross out market or city and only focus on neighborhoods, mm -hmm. um, and focus on the sole comparables. Uh, I, that's, that's God, that, these are always, it depends questions or answers because the market needs to be strong as well. I would say focus on your market more for like the strength of the market, you know, is, are you, because you could have like a neighborhood in a, in a town that's got 4,000 people. You know what I mean? And there's a neighborhood that's got lots of sold comparables. That doesn't mean that it's a good place to flip or it's a good place to do burrs. Yeah, for sure. So I think your market or city, you know, needs to be strong and have a good mode around it that, you know, protects it, that it's a good place to invest in and that there's lots of demand and there's lots of jobs and those types of things. I think your neighborhood is, is where you need to focus on for your sold comps because that's what um, your realtor or someone else's realtor and appraisers are going to be um, using uh, to determine uh, the value. Okay. So the question of how many, the minimum number of sold comps, actually, do you just want to explain what a sold comp is really quickly? 
Yeah, for sure. So when you're um, selling a property or when you're looking to buy a property that you're going to be selling, you want to look at sold comparables, which means properties that have sold within that same neighborhood with the same type of property, same square footage, same lot size, same number of bedrooms, same number of bathrooms, same, same. You're looking at all the same, same apples properties, to apples. apples to apples, um, to get a good idea of the value um, or the price that you'll be able to list your property at and that it should move because properties in the last within the last six months have sold for that price. Yes. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, the market is the market in real estate. Um, as much as we'd like to uh, just say my house is worth this much, um, when it comes to market value, uh, whatever a house similar to yours is sold for in the last 60 to 90 days is the value of your home. If your neighbor has the exact same layout, exact same lot size, square footage of the house, they sell their house for a certain price in the last 30 to 60 days, and the the finishings are, are fairly similar to yours on the inside, and then that is what your house is worth, whatever it sold, your neighbor sold it for. Um, and that can change. That's the interesting thing is that if you, you can totally sell it for more, you can sell it for $30,000 more, and now that type of house in that neighborhood is worth $30,000 more. Um, the market is the market, but, uh, when trying to determine what you can sell a property for, you need to go and check, uh, recently sold comparables, comparable sold properties in your area to determine what the value of your property is. And understanding those sold comparables ahead of time will help you determine whether this is a neighborhood that you can do flips and burrs in. Um, it's, it's, it's your market research, um, to determine the strength of this. So. You know, what Colin's asking is, you know, what's the minimum number of sold comparables you want to see in the last 60 to 90 days that will interest you in investing in a particular neighborhood? Um, I would say that there isn't, I, I don't think I have a minimum, but I, I rely on, I, I mentioned earlier, like this is a realtor question. I rely on my realtor because they're the ones that, that give me the most confidence on my ability to sell the property in the future or, or the, the, the market value of properties. Uh, currently in that in that neighborhood. I would say it's going to differ for flips compared to burrs. I would say with flips, I want to see enough. Um, but I also want to make sure that it's not a completely saturated um, neighborhood. I, I think for flips, I what I'm looking for for sold comparables is I'm looking for um, sold comparables that are flip, like high-end flip quality. Because if I have lots of houses that have sold that are similar to this type of property, that's great. But what I'm looking for is I'm looking for something to compare to. I want sold comparables that I can compare to for the type of product that I'm going to be selling. And that is a higher end flip product and not a house that was renovated in early 2000s. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because... There are lots of neighborhoods that have lots of sold comparables or lots of neighborhoods where you can get really good deals in your city, but they might not be flip neighborhoods. And at least for the city that we invest in, which is Edmonton, there are certain, there's about 10, maybe 15 neighborhoods in Edmonton that are just known, that are just known for being a good area for flips. And that's just because lots of flippers buy houses in that area and they sell them as flips. And if you, when you look at the sold comparables, you'll see lots of solds that, that are flips. You can, they're, they're quite clear that it's evident that they're high end finishings. Um, and they tend to get a higher um, value than say something that is original or maybe renovated in the early 2000s, right? So you want good sold, strong sold comparables with flip properties. And I want to make sure that I've got lots, I want as many as possible, obviously, but I also want them as recent as possible because if it's, if we're talking like 120 days, if I'm looking at a neighborhood right now and I'm about to buy a property there, that's maybe a little dilapidated that I'm going to renovate and I want to flip it uh, and sell it for profit. If my most recent sold comparables are 120 days or 150 days, which is like four months to six months, sorry, five months. By the time I buy this property, 
and I renovate it and I get it on the market, that sold comparable is going to be completely out of the mix. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Because when I go to sell it in five months from now, when I'm done, my buyers, my potential buyers, their realtors are going to be pulling up the sold comparables for our property. And that property that I was referring to, I was using it as a reference, is not even going to come up in their search of the last 60 to 90 days. So ideally what I want is, is not a minimum number of sold comps, but I'd say more recent sold comps are the most relevant for me. Or investing in a neighborhood that is kind of well known for flips. Because a, a, a good experienced realtor on, 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 my, on my buyer's side is going to know, okay, there are lots of, you know, there's lots of flips that kind of go on in this neighborhood. It's highly sought after for, you know, a mature neighborhood that has, you know, nice renovations. And I, they would know that a house that is renovated, that has been flipped in this area is generally worth this much. But if you're trying to force it in a neighborhood that doesn't normally do flips, and we've had this happen in the past where we've yep. tried to, we found really good deals and we we tried to sell them in neighborhoods that don't really have that reputation as being a, a flip neighborhood. It was very hard for us to justify that price when we didn't have recent sold comparables when we put it on the market. I hope, does that make sense? Am I yep. explaining that properly? Yep. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to give you guys, I, I could just give you a, a, some BS number, but I really want you to truly understand this because it's it's a very good question. So less, what's less, in, it's less important about the minimum number of sold comparables, and, and more important about the most recent sold comparables that are the exact same or similar to the product that we are going to be selling, which is, you know, brand new kitchen, brand new basement, you know, nice exterior, all new flooring, all new paint. You know what I mean? Like a really high end, you know, flip quality. Um, because when our potential buyers get their realtor to pull comparables. I want them to look up and see what other houses like ours have sold for. And I want them to be able to look at the pictures and look at the description of the of our property and compare it to houses that have sold in the last 30 to 90 days. And I want them to be like, okay, their property that they're selling is exactly the same or similar to this type of property. And that type of property sold for this much money. So that you know what, their price is within range. But if we're if we if we don't have any good sold comparables and our solds, you know, the, the buy the potential buyers looking at the sold comparables and they're all like, you know, mom and dad renovated it in two thousand five type houses or original houses on the same street and yeah they're on the same street yeah they're the same layout same you know same lot size same square footage, but like theirs is like older and ours is newer, you can't compare apples to oranges. And what they're going to be doing is they're going to see that that house sold, the original one sold for 390000 Why are you trying to sell yours for six hundred and ten? And what they're going to do is they're going to try and figure out the difference between the $390,000 house and the $610,000 house. And it's going to be a tough thing to justify. Because they're going to be like, well, they, they couldn't have spent more than $100,000 worth of renovation, so it shouldn't be worth more than four ninety, dollars right? Mm-hmm. But if you had some houses that have sold, if they pull comps and they see a $390,000 house, which is original, and they see a, three other houses that were flipped or like higher end renovated, and they sold for 600 and 610 and 620, then they make, okay, cool. It's quite clear that the market says that this house in this condition renovated to this, this, these finishings is worth 610, 620. And they're willing to pay for it because they know that the market, someone else has paid that price for it. And that's really what it comes down to for a buyer is that they just want to make sure that they're not overpaying. If all they see is $390,000, that doesn't give them a whole lot of confidence in making this huge investment into their home or, or an investment property when they don't feel confident that the value is there. They don't, nobody wants to overpay, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's why it's kind of hard, like, trying to flip houses in neighborhoods that, that don't really have that, that history or that, that reputation of having flip houses in there. And a realtor's, uh, the, the buyer's realtor is, is probably going to be warning them of like, yeah, I think this is overpriced. I think we can get them down a little bit. I, I, I would say that the market value would be 
you know, my comparative market analysis would say that it's it's probably worth at most 450 to 490. And then you're going to get a low ball ask. And even though you know that it's worth that much because you've seen solds in the past, if you don't have anything recent, the buyer's realtor is going to be working against you. And it's going to be a tough, it's a, it's a tough justification. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that's for fix and flips. I have a couple notes. Um, I just want to drive home really quickly that your power team like is, and, and Wayne said it, but I just don't think he emphasized it enough is that, you know, like it's so important to have a power team doing this kind of work for you. You know, like you, you should just like be, f be focusing on what you need to focus on and let the experts do what they are good at doing. And so that's why it's just so important to have a really great investor focused realtor who really knows the city, the neighborhoods, the markets, where the flip neighborhoods are, where they're not, those types of things who can really help to direct you. And I definitely say like that it's way less about, you know, a certain number of sold comps compared to your realtor giving you the confidence that this is a great neighborhood to be doing flips in. You can do them all day long. And this is, you know, the price ranges that they're going to be pumped out at. On the flip side of that, <laughs> I, <laughs> that was unintentional. <laughs> um, you know, Wayne had said that, you know, as many as possible, ideally, for sold comps, as many as possible. And I want to challenge that a little bit because I can think of a specific neighborhood in Edmonton and I'll, I'll name it. It's uh, Otwell mm -hmm. where it's known very well as a flip neighborhood, very, very well as a flip neighborhood. People flock to it for flips, yep. but now it's saturated. There's too many people yep. trying to flip in it. There's too many options. There's too many people doing the same types of flips. And what's happening is that Yes, people are expecting that that's where, you know, you're going to find the right priced houses to do that, those type kind of flips and get that kind of ARV. But you're sitting on the market for too long because there's too many options. Yeah, too many apples in the basket. Too many apples in the basket. So I wouldn't say as many as possible. I would say rely on your power team. Yeah. <laughs> because Calvin would tell us, mm, oh, it was pretty saturated. I don't know. You could. You know, you're going to, this is what the ARV is going to be, but you might have trouble selling. Yeah. Um, so, so two additional notes onto that is that um, don't just choose any realtor and just because they're, they're an invest. Okay. Just because they're well known in the community as an investor focused realtor doesn't necessarily mean that they possess the, the understanding and experience of working with fix and flippers. Yes. Now I, and every realtor is going to say that yeah of course yeah I, I deal with lots of fix and flippers but that's you shouldn't just rely on that what i would highly recommend is i would recommend asking other fix and flippers if they're willing to let you know uh fix and flips are kind of a, a competitive kind of market Actually, you know what, rather than scratch that, rather than asking fix and flippers, just watch and see who fix and flippers use. Yeah, 100%. Right. And that's what we did when we were, when we were really trying to ramp it up. So I want to find the person that's everyone's working with for fix and flips because they know the market. And it's different than buying rental properties. It's completely different. It's different than buying multifamily buildings. It's different than buying a home, Right. You got to have someone who, who understands these, these little, these little markets and, and, and little pockets and stuff that work. And, and, you know, we talked about Calvin, Calvin's fantastic. Um, he'll, he'll be honest with us and he sometimes too honest too <laughs> uh, annoyingly honest, <laughs> which is fine. I'm being told the things that I need to hear the things that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Even when you don't want to hear him and he's not afraid to say it. Yeah. He's not afraid to say it. But he he's doing it for for us and doing it for himself as well. He's like, I don't want you. He's not gonna like. He's not gonna pump us up. And be like, oh yeah, for sure, yeah, absolutely, you can do this. Yeah, it'll totally work. And then it just sits on the market for six months. It doesn't really help him at all. Yeah. Um. He's and many a times he's given us feedback and, and and advice on you know even on our finishings. Hey guys, you guys gonna do something about that? 
that right there, he'll give us that right there is what a buyer is going to be calling you on mm -hmm. right there. So you got some money to put into that. And I'm like, I'm not spending $3,000 on, on replacing that. Okay. Well, I mean, can you at least do this? Like he's just. And sure as shit. We don't do it. Buyers come through and that's the problem. <laughs> sure as shit. So, you know, it's, it's, it's in your best interest to have the right realtor who understands it and the right realtor who, um, who has experience of like hearing what buyers say in those situations. And, um, you know, we bought a house, uh, and, and flipped it and it was on a main street. And he told me right from the beginning, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. And it had no garage. I wouldn't do it. I'm like, fine, I'll build a garage. Wouldn't do it. And then sure enough, it sat on the market forever because it was on a main street. So, uh, listen to your, in, you know, your, your investor focused or flip focused, uh, realtors, they will give you the best feedback. It's, it's, it's a, it's a win-win arrangement, right? Because they want to give you the best feedback so that you're successful and you make lots of money and you do more business with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, there was something else, but I lost my train of thought on that. So, um, also, can I say one last thing? Yeah. Okay. So if you don't, if you just like simply cannot find an investor focused realtor who knows what they're talking about in your market and you are just certain that they don't really exist and you're trying to do the research yourself, Look at if you're like focusing in on a neighborhood and you're like, I think that this one seems like it could be a flip neighborhood. Look at all like look, look back more than 60 and 90 days, like look back like at like the last like two years, if you can, at all everything that is sold in the neighborhood, every single house, no price range, just start looking at every single house that's sold and tr and start to to try to see how many of these houses have actually been renovated to the point where it looks like it could have been a flip yeah and you're gonna find you're fi gonna find out quickly that like okay like there's only been like you know a few over the past couple of years that have been renovated like all the way up to the nines and so that's very likely not a flip neighborhood right mm -hmm. and if you, but if you're seeing lots and you're like okay there's been lots of action happening in this neighborhood lots of houses sold that look really great and like there's been you know and maybe a few more recently and that sort of thing, then you're starting to get warm, right? Yeah. So if like, instead of just looking at that 60 to 90 days, really look at the neighborhood as a whole, what's been happening the last couple of years here? Has there been some revitalization? Have people been coming in and, and improving those prices? If you find a flip, look at the history of it. Go on to, what is it, like Honest Door, like one of those types of things and say, okay, you can, if, if you're like, well, this is definitely a flip and it looks like it sold for a pretty good price, go on to Honest Door, see what they bought it for, you know, however many months ago, mm -hmm. and then what it was sold for. That's the kind of spread they had. So you can dig into it if you don't have expert support. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um and this is this is great information for realtors as well. If you guys are wanting to become more investor focused or more flip, you know, you you want to help your clients who are are fix and flippers. Um, hopefully, this is helpful for you as well. I want to add uh, that uh, at the end of the day, sole comparables is one thing, but also demand buyer demand is probably the most important. Yeah. Um, obviously, you want to. So when when you're looking at sole comparables and everything we've talked about, you know, for the last twenty minutes. All of this is is for um, is for justifying the price that you're going to be selling this product for. Okay, it's all for price justification. However, you can justify a price, but if nobody wants to live in that neighborhood, then no one's going to live in that neighborhood. No one's going to buy it, and there needs to be a demand for that type of product in that type of area. You know it. If you're trying to push a high end flip in a C area in in a very secluded area of town that doesn't have access to anything that someone would be looking for in that area, i.e. transit, i.e. close to downtown, i.e. close to the river, i.e. close to the big park or the big theater or or the the hockey um arena or whichever else. If you have to understand that the type of people that are willing to pay $610,000 for a $390,000 house, they're looking for a certain type of vibe at, or culture in that neighborhood. And there are neighborhoods that are just, that work really well. And there's a reason why people flip houses in those neighborhoods and those mature neighborhoods is because people want high end 
houses in those mature neighborhoods close to all of those amenities. And a lot of times it's your walking trails and your river and your downtown, Mm -hmm. right? Or the trendy areas that have the really nice restaurants or the really nice coffee shops. You know what I'm saying? Every city has those types of areas or those are the higher end places. And if you're trying to push for a higher value on a product because yours is nicer, you kind of need to have it in one of those areas. But just be cautious, like Gabby said, this make sure that, hey, everybody said Otwell, but there's like 40 of the same product on the market right now. And they have lots to choose from. Yeah. Now, if there was only one or two on the market and there was good sold comparables, then you would be the only one that they can choose from. But this happened earlier this year and last year that like people just flocked to the same neighborhoods because they saw other investors doing it and they got burnt. Yeah. They got burnt because they're just, they put this, they, for the most part, most flip properties, they, they kind of use the same template as far as like finishings go, whatever is relevant at the, you know, at this particular time. So you've got like tons on the market and they're all the same price and you no longer have a competitive edge. People are, are being picky. Well, like, well, I can choose this one. This one's on a, on a better street. This one has a better yard. Whereas if you were the only one, you'd be able to get away with it, right? Yeah. So just consider that as well when you're, when you're thinking about um, uh, markets and, and neighborhoods uh, for, um, for choosing for flips. Now for burrs, I'm going to finish out the show on burrs because this is important. Um, burrs does not follow the same um, uh, fundamentals or criteria. Because Burrs is 100% based off of sold comparables. It doesn't matter about demand because you're not selling the property. It doesn't matter about the area um, of what buyers are willing to pay in because, or, or what, what neighborhoods are hot because it doesn't matter. All that you are relying on for a Burr is the after repaired value and that's based off of the appraiser's appraisal. Okay, so what the appraiser says that the house is worth will determine what the financing you're going to be able to refinance that to. Okay. So I'd say the two most important things for when you are doing burrs is your buy price, the the price you pay for it. And also uh, what the appraiser says it's worth afterwards. Okay. So, you 100% want to have good sold comparables when you are buying good, strong sold comparables. And you want to get in and out of that property as quickly as possible. If you look at a particular neighborhood and you see that something like this has, has sold or multiple houses like yours, the one you're about to buy the subject property has sold for this price. And it's quite clear and evident that there are three properties, all similar to yours, all similar to the finishings that you're going to be putting in that property or renovating it to. And they're all within that price range. Then it's very likely if you go back to the bank and you ask to refinance it once you're done your renovation, the appraiser is going to pull the sold comparables and they're going to get the exact same sold comparables that you saw two months ago when you bought the property. So getting in and out of a burr quickly is super important because a lot can change in six months or 12 months. If you have really good soul comparables in a neighborhood, if you're able to get a property for a really good price and you know I can renovate it for this much money and it's going to be worth this much afterwards and you wait six to 12 months to refinance that property, all of those soul comparables that were relevant that you used as a reference when you first analyzed the property are gone. When the appraiser pulls the comparables, they're going to pull the last three to six months to see what a property like this is sold for. And those comparables won't be in it. So you are at the mercy of whatever other people sell their houses for in that area, similar to yours, while you are renovating it. And that is risky. Mm -hmm. Now, we can all hope and assume that someone who puts their house in the market while you're renovating it are going to use the similar sold comparables and list their price accordingly based off of the market value of the houses. However, it only takes one jerk to sell their house for $50,000 less and completely ruin it for you. And we've seen it happen. And we've seen it happen. And in a lot of cases, it's not like they're like, I need to get rid of this house really fast. It's like their house was just like, I don't know, had some sort of a, 
a defect or something like that. Or maybe it was, maybe it was a bit of a hoarder house, or maybe it needed a bunch of work, or maybe the furnace was old, or maybe the roof shingles were curling. They're not really, all they're going to do is they're going to pull all the comparables of houses that were similar to it. They'll look at the pictures very quickly. And we all know that if you've ever looked at um, MLS uh, listing pictures, they always look nicer on pictures than they do in person. And you can't smell pictures. So someone who smoked in this house for 20, 30 years, it's going to look the same as whatever other houses on the street, but you're not going to, you're not going to be able to get in there to actually see, okay, oh God, it's really rough around the edges. Oh God. I didn't realize there's a body in the closet. <laughs> I didn't, awkward. I didn't realize they didn't, they didn't show the picture of the basement that had the giant, you know, vertical foundation crack that was just like completely obvious that scared a bunch of people away. Now for us as investors, that doesn't scare us very much, but you know, for a home buyer that's coming in and looking at it, like, Oh my God, the phone, the house is going to fall over. So they probably got a really good deal on it because they, they were going to have to do a bunch of renovations. They're going to have to fill that crack. Um, they're going to have to dispose of that body. And so they got a $50,000 deal on it, but that doesn't, they don't say that in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sale notes. So when the appraiser pulls the sold comparables, all they see is that a house similar to this has sold for this. You're screwed. So what they're going to do is they're going to take into account all of the sold comparables in the last, um, whatever, uh, three to six months or zero to six months. Um, and they're going to take all of them. They're going to add up all, let's say there's five and they're all really good and close. They'll take up all of the sold prices for all five of them and they'll create a mean average, which is they'll add them all up and divide it by five. That, that one that sold for $50,000 less is going to bring your average down, which is going to mean that you're not going to be able to get as much of on your appraisal on your after repaired value as you wanted or expected. Maybe you've got four houses that sold for six hundred thousand, and then you got one for five fifty. That's going to drop your number down or less. So if you're expecting to get all of your money out of the deal, or you're expecting to get most of your money out of the deal, again, like the most important thing I would say is just making sure that you get in and out of that burr, that renovation as quickly as possible, and getting that refinance done, so you have good, reliable sold comps. The alternative to that would be if you can't, for whatever reason, there's lots of reasons which I can't really get into, uh, say, for example, um, lenders and changing the rules about when you can refinance, for, for example, if you do have to wait 12 months, then I would be strategic in waiting until you know there's good sold comparables. And what you can do is you can ask your, this is a hot tip, by the way, you can ask your realtor to set you up on a search for solds that fit that criteria. Now, most people know that, you know, you ask a realtor to set you up on a search for properties that come available. They can also set you up on an email search for properties that have sold that fit that criteria. So if you are renovating it, you're, you know, adding value to that property, you've increased the value and you want to refinance it and do a burr, um, ask your realtor to set it up. So houses like this that sell, you get an email notification, you can see what it sold for. So that way, when you see a bunch of emails come in that you've seen a bunch of properties similar to yours has sold and they're all within the right price range of what you're wanting, then call the bank and ask for a refinance. Then get the appraiser to come out because the appraiser, when they pull the recent sold comparables, they're going to get those recent sold comparables that just popped up and they're going to be the most relevant solds and therefore you're going to get the best possible chance of getting the value that you want for your appraisal, which is going to mean the best possible amount of money back out of the deal for that burr. But you have to be patient on that. And I've seen so many people that are just like, oh, I went and did the refinance or I got the, you know, the appraiser came in significantly lower. I'm like, well, did you wait? No, I just went ahead and did it. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, had you, had you just waited, maybe you could have got a better sold comparable in a little bit longer and you could have got more money out. You know what I mean? You don't have to accept whatever the appraisal is. You can, there's a couple different options. You can also ask for a second appraisal or you can get your own appraisal done and I, you can make an argument. It's not always going to, you're not always going to win that argument, but it'd be like, Hey, I've got an appraisal right here from a separate appraiser that says it's worth this and make it, you can challenge it. And ultimately at the end of the day, you don't have to accept their appraisal. You can just say, okay, I'm not going to refinance and just wait longer wait till you get some better soul comparables and then do your appraisal then. Mm -hmm. 
Great tip. Uh, I, I mean, so again, sorry, sorry, Colin, for like, you know, kind of getting away from the original question, but you know, the minimum number of soul comps is for a burr, I would say you want a few, um, but you want a few that supports the value that you're expecting. Right. And at the very least, if you are going to do burrs, you do need sold comps. So there's no minimum, but I'd say at least one. Yeah. And if they don't have any good sold comparables in your neighborhood, what they tend to do is they tend to pull sold comparables from other neighboring close neighborhoods within a few kilometers to see what houses in outside of this neighborhood or outside of the street have sold for. They take into consideration everything. I don't understand the whole formula for how they go about doing it. It's not just sole comparables. They take into consideration, you know, new upgrades that you add in and they have a, they have a whole complicated formula, which I have no idea what it is. But for burrs, I would say you want at least one or two good sole comps, recent sole comps to give you confidence in, in doing that. And the city and the strength of the market is less important than it is for flips. Great. Yeah. I'd say what's more important information for you is the strength of the rental market, because this, when you do a burr, you're not selling it. You're not getting in and out and selling it. What you're doing is you're keeping it as a long-term rental. That's what BRRRR stands for, right? Buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. And the third one was rent. So you're going to be keeping this as a long-term rental. Don't just do it in any neighborhood because you can get a lot of your money back out or you got good soul comps. You need to make sure that this actually operates well as a rental as for your rental business. And you need to make sure that it has cash flow. It will operate as a good rental that you take into consideration your tenant profile among other things, the basic fundamentals of, of buying rental properties. Awesome. I think that was a great answer. I know not exactly what he wanted, but <laughs> I think it's what he needed. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I hope, I hope that gives him a better understanding on how to choose markets. Yeah. Right. Um, and he actually says tons of knowledge here. Got to listen to it again. Thank you. Awesome. Fabulous. Um, that about wraps up our show. I think perfect timing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Just getting our get daughter our, over here. <laughs> trying to get our daughter's attention. Okay. Thank you guys for spending your Monday morning with us and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Interested in being a guest on the show? Send us an email to info at reimorningshow.com. 